Good evening, everyone, and welcome to HIV AIDS in the 80s. This evening, we'll be hearing about firsthand accounts of the Santa Cruz scene. This event is sponsored by the Friends of the Capitola Branch Library. To join this event using a telephone only, please dial any of the following numbers. I'll read a couple of them to you aloud. 1-888-788-0099. 4-1-8-3-3-5-4-8-0-2-8-2, and then slowly enter the webinar ID of 997-8284-8092, and then the passcode is 2021-0201. As an attendee, your microphone is muted for the entire presentation. We are not taking open mic comments this evening. You do not need a microphone, camera, or a screen if you only want to listen to this meeting, as this meeting is accessible by landline or mobile phone. We are taking questions. If you're joining by computer, you may use the Q&A feature to type your questions on the attendee control bar near the bottom of the screen. You'll see the Q&A icon. In the lower left corner, you'll see audio settings. In the center, you'll see an icon that says Q&A and then leave in a red rectangle. If you're using a mobile device, the Q&A icon likely appears near the top right corner of the screen. In the upper left corner, you'll see leave meeting in red letters. You'll see the meeting ID and then the Q&A icon in the upper right corner. Once the event begins, if you're joining by a computer to see all the panelists, you may need to select gallery view. Depending on the size of your mobile device screen, you may need to scroll over to view whoever is speaking. If you're accessing this meeting via a Chromebook or the web browser only, you may not see all panelists at one time, only the panelists speaking. I'll now turn it over to Denise Ward with the Friends of the Aptos Library. Denise? Hi, good evening. Tonight is the kickoff for our fourth year of Our Community Reads. And what an impressive panel we have tonight. Thank you to the Friends of the Capitola Library for sponsoring this event. These events are made possible by your generosity. And so if you would like to make a donation to our program, please visit the Friends of the Aptos Library website. I think you should be able to see the link uh, on your screen. I'd also like to remind everybody our next lecture event is scheduled for February 7th when David Reichert of CSUMB will discuss HIV AIDS activism and the politics of a pandemic. Be sure to join us for that. Our panelists tonight, Senator John Laird with Dr. Jerry Solomon and Joe Kenny are here to discuss HIV AIDS in the 80s and the impact it had here in Santa Cruz. Without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to our guests to briefly introduce themselves, and then we'll dive right into it. Thank you all for being here. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sarah, and thank you, Denise. And thanks for all of you that have logged in and all of you that are library supporters and engaged in community reads. And uh, I just thought uh, I would do a brief thing and uh, as sort of an introduction and then let Joe and Jerry Solomon, our other two panelists, introduced themselves. And I think it's important to sort of introduce ourselves it, maybe up to the 80s at the beginning and sort of who were we at the time that we were first experiencing HIV in Santa Cruz County and around the state and the nation when that happened? Because um, I tell the story that when the movie Milk came out, I didn't go see it for a few months. Uh, I knew how it ended and that didn't make me very happy. And I thought this is not gonna be, I knew I met him a few times. I knew people around him. I didn't know if it was gonna ne necessarily be a pleasurable experience. All those things were true when I actually saw it, but there was an interesting thing that struck me that I didn't expect is you look at uh, in your mind at that time through the prism of everything that has happened since then. And that movie was about everything that was happening then without us knowing what was coming. And there was, I remember when the police would raid bars and, and they had a response team and they would rush over to defend people and all the different things that happened. And you just forget about that. You forget that that those were difficult times. It was uh, when I came of age, it was illegal to be gay in all 50 states. And uh, there was not really anything 
uh, uh, that was organized at a very broad level. And there's a certain element of that that is true when we talk about tonight's topic. And for me, I sort of struggled with coming out in the 70s. Uh, it came roaring out in the early 80s in, in the news. And I thought at the time, uh, being openly gay as an elected official in Santa Cruz, I was late. I was late coming out. But now in retrospect, it, it, when I was elected mayor in 1983 and was one of the first three mayors elected in the country that were open, it was all that year, um, there were only 10 or 12 openly LGBT elected officials in the entire United States. There are more now in the Monterey Bay area than there were in the entire United States in the early 1980s. And so it's hard to look back at that time. I mean, when I ran for reelection in 1985, there was a full page uh, ad put in the paper against me because of that. And those were things that were more normal uh, in that time. And that is the backdrop for how we started to experience HIV uh, in that period of time. So uh, uh, the two panelists we have will introduce themselves, Joe Kenny and Jerry Solomon, and all three of us were involved in the, in the Santa Cruz AIDS project is either director or board of directors or, or opening one. And then I think they will tell you about themselves. So Joe, why don't you tell us a little about your biography and about sort of how you moved into that time. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. I, um, I was just thinking when John was introducing I was a volunteer with the Santa Cruz Women's Health Center at the time. I worked at the Santa Cruz Community Credit Union and um, I come out in the late 70s. Um, and in the early 80s, I sat as a volunteer for Gary Patton on the Public Health Commission. And there was only one periodical I could find that was tracking um, AIDS, and it was the gay community news out of Massachusetts, I think it was Boston. And every time we had a public health meeting, I would bring this periodical to the public health officer, George Newell, and say, George, do you have any idea how many gay men live here? Do you have any idea how many gay men visit Santa Cruz? <laughs> you know, we're in trouble. This is going to, this is really going to have an impact. Um, so that was the early 80s and people started getting sick. I'm not gonna go into quite much of that right now, but I officially joined the AIDS project in 1988. And I was either the first or one of the first lesbians that had a position of leadership in any AIDS organization in the country. And I remember, um, doing an interview with Gerald, the outgoing director and myself coming in. And uh, after we did the interview, the reporter called me the day before it was published and said, you did say you were a lesbian, right? I said, <laughs> yeah, I did. And he said, well, it's in the, it's in the, you know, it's in the piece. I said, okay, no problem. So the next day I open it up, bottom fold, drop cap, lesbians are among the lowest list group for HIV AIDS. And yet Joe Kenny, comma, a lesbian, comma. <laughs> <laughs> so I got all these calls all day long from people and it was, uh, it was quite the thing for the day. I didn't, like John, I didn't realize that it was gonna be a big deal at that point in time. So that's my introduction. Jerry, you're on. And you have to unmute, Jerry. You have to unmute. Yeah. Uh, You're all, we can hear you now. OK, good. Um, so I'll start my story uh, in San Diego in the late in the early 70s when I was earning my graduate de degree in clinical psychology. And fortunately, the year before I graduated, the state changed the law so that I could be licensed as a psychologist because I'd already come out as a gay man and it was illegal to be a psychologist. Uh, in the state of California if you were gay or lesbian. And so I did attend graduate school hoping that that would change, but I knew that perhaps at the end of my graduate training, 
I would not be able to do counseling or psychology in the state of California. Um, I moved up in 1976 to Santa Cruz and joined the Santa Cruz Community Counseling Center, uh, which is now called Encompass. And at that time, the public health officer, uh, Jerry Hall, called me up. <clears throat> he said, I heard you're gay and it's about time we had a gay mental health professional in this community. I hadn't decided I was gonna come out yet, but it was clear that I was out, that was 1976. And so I, I uh, head up the outpatient department of the Santa Cruz Community Counseling Center of Drug Abuse and Domestic Violence that was put in place in the late 70s. Uh, and I think all of us here were both on the edge of dealing with HIV AIDS and also being gay and lesbian people who are trying to find uh, a way in the world with dignity and respect. And each of us, I think, has stories to talk about that too, a little to the side of what we're talking about right now. Uh, as a clinical psychologist, I ended up working with the first two deaths uh, in Santa Cruz County. They both came from staff from the U University of uh, Santa Cruz, Charlie Braun, who was a uh, psychology professor there, and Sam Singer, who was a biology professor and also a physician at the Student Health Center. Uh, both were personal friends uh, with me and uh, both were people that I uh, worked with until they died. Uh, after that point, it became apparent that HIV AIDS was in our community. People were dying from it and there was no way that one or two people could manage the crisis. And so in late 1983, 1984, I convened a large community-wide meeting to talk about the prospects of establishing a nonprofit organization to deal with the health crisis that became HIV AIDS. And um, I'll stop there. That brings me up to, I think, where I need to be also. And, and I would just say that it was all struggling in those first times of figuring it out that people, I mean, I remember Charlie Braun, one of the two that Jerry mentioned, coming out to the bar one night and having a rough time. And that was the first time I had ever seen anybody. It was in the early 1980s. He was sort of could barely walk, uh, uh, understand exactly what the impact was. And, and just to add the other thing to my story, it, it sort of, I think when Harvey Milk was killed, I thought, oh my God, I always wanted a career in public policy and public service. And yet if you can't survive in San Francisco, how's that gonna happen anywhere else? I'm gonna have to choose. I'm gonna have to choose between being out or pursuing the career that I thought I wanted and was really good at. And I, I sort of went into the wilderness for a while and took a six month trip to Central and South America and sort of decided in that, well, I'm letting bad people make that decision for the wrong reasons and, and came back and did it. And, and I think that it is, as Joe and Jerry were saying, we all had this period of discovery that's very personal that sort of brings us to that time. And Joe, uh, uh, Joe and Jerry, you were just mentioning the early uh, 80s. Um, when you both started talking with people in the community about a response, what started to happen? Uh, I mean, what did you hear? What were the obstacles? Uh, what happened in Santa Cruz at that time? And I don't know who wants to go first. I'll, I'll start. Um, is that okay, Joe? Good. Um, <clears throat> In 1983, I went to the second annual AIDS conference held in Denver. There were 700 cases of AIDS in the United States at that point in time. And the Centers for Disease Control had convened this meeting to try to get local communities to prepare for the epidemic that was to come. Just the context, which is alluded to in the book, Ronald Reagan was the president of the United States and for the first seven years of the epidemic, never mentioned HIV AIDS. And so the CDC had to steal money from others in order to fund uh, the project uh, that CDC was endeavoring. So in 83, I went out there and heard the news of what was coming and went back uh, to Santa Cruz and met with George Wolf, who was the health director at the time, and asked him whether he would sponsor a meeting uh, as a health crisis for the county rather than as a gay crisis and allow me the opportunity to sh start sharing the information to the gay men's community. And I, as I say often, it was a very tough sell. These were gay men that were celebrating the end of the Vietnam War. Disco was still quite alive. 
and uh, the people were party hardying quite a bit. And I stood up there in front of them and said, we need to start using condoms. And this went over like a, a lead balloon. This was not greeted positively and people were very, very distressed and thought I was being sex negative or anti-sex. And so very early on, it was clear that some people were gonna follow the guidance and some people were gonna think it was a conspiracy. And that's a segue to thinking about what we're seeing with the epidemic today. So we had people who were aligned with the science and were following it and were uh, engaging in behaviors that were appropriate to the science. And then we had people who were just downright deniers and refused to believe that it was true and really didn't want to start partying at the time. And so we had a bifurcation in the community pretty early on, uh, sort of people who were trying to stay healthy and well, and other people who just wanted to continue to party and just believed they were going to be immune from the situation. Joe, do you want to pick it up from there? Whoop, sorry. <laughs> One of the things I have been thinking about was um, the role of the larger LGBT community at that time. I knew people were having a lot of private conversations about their risks and um, their relationships and whether they had open relationships. And um, Scotty Brookie and I and Michael Perlman put out the Lavender Reader. And that was the pretty much the only LGBT written materials in the county. And came out four times a year and um, Michael was the editor and we were, I mean, yeah. And, and we were the two people that addressed the content. We started having people write their personal stories. That's where, that's where the most impact was. Rather than, you know, gay community news and other places were doing all of the technical stuff about staying safe, but people were talking about their lives and whether they were taking risks or not taking risks. And for me, sorry, I'm, I'm a little emotional. Always, always happens. Um, these guys were really young. We were all really young. <laughs> You know, I look back and I look at pictures and say, oh my God, you know, how old was he? How old was she? And um, women were basically stepping up to provide support once the AIDS project was created. Um, but it was really in the early days, it was really about men. Um, and a number of men had dual, um, dual things that put them at risk and it was um, drugs and being gay or, or bi or closeted. And um, all of that came out once we were, once the AIDS project was created and started addressing what the risk factors were for people. And that's Gerald who's on the left, who was the first ex executive director of the Santa Cruz AIDS project. Uh, Charlie, uh, in the book, makes a comment. He, as you remember, he uh, was in charge of a gay newspaper. And he comments in the book, I'm going to start hiring lesbians because gay men die. As trying to find staff to keep the, the operation going for Charlie's newspaper. And in some ways, when we in Santa Cruz began to look at staffing, uh, we really saw always the value of women, but also the fact that they seem to be out of harm's way right now and could provide some continuity for the project. Because up, up until 1985, no one knew what their status was, that the, the HIV test rolled out in 85. Mm -hmm. Many people hesitated to take it as, as the book describes. And in fact, many people never took the test, just were presumptively, unfortunately diagnosed with AIDS and then progressed uh, in their illness. Um, so I do want to add that fact that women became a critical factor in Santa Cruz and women stepped in eagerly 
And uh, it was a startling experience for Santa Cruz because prior to that event, we were highly separatist in our environments. We did meet periodically at the bar or on the dance floor, but that was about it. And this shift really changed the dynamics in the gay and lesbian community in Santa Cruz from that point forward, I believe, actually. Yeah. And it, uh, uh, just to pick up on that for a second, because it, it's a really strong theme. What was happening is this was forcing so many different issues. It, it forced a lot of men to come out who just, they didn't have much choice when this happened. Uh, 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 they had to deal with it. And as Jerry said, and he said it really rightly, we could tell tons of stories about men and women in just in the 70s, what a struggle it was. And, and you know, men that didn't get what was going on with women and uh, all the stuff that was going on. I could go into a gory detail. And, and yet when the epidemic happened, uh, when we did volunteers a little later, but it started in this era with, with the Santa Cruz AIDS project, there were just many more women that volunteered because a lot of men, if the men weren't sick, they couldn't face up to this. This just forced them to look at it all the time. And so they weren't really about to volunteer and the women really stepped up in a phenomenal major way. And I think it's, um, it for the first time sort of uh, uh, provided some connection in the community that was really intense and it was lasting. And, and it, it was really out of that different response and it was really powerful. I mean, it truly became a lesbian and gay community because uh, the gay men were coming out when they didn't want to and the lesbians were rising to the occasion uh, uh, in volunteering and serving and, and making organizations work. Joe might have been an exception as an executive director, but she was not an exception in the body of the people that were involved in the program. And, and it was really significant and it was really significant across Santa Cruz because if I can digress and and because I, I always love to tell stories, there was this time in the late 70s when I can't remember what the name of the club was. It was over on Commercial Way after Mona's Gorilla Lounge and before the place that's been the jazz club and the music club. But they published an advertisement in the Good Times that had two stick figures of men next to each other and had a circle and a line to it, and two stick figures of women next to each other and had a circle and a line to it, and just had a stick figure of a man and a woman. So there was this organizing thing that was brilliant at the time where about 50 of us went over to somebody's house, all gay men and all lesbians, and it was a woman's night and we paired off and we went in as, as men and women couples and then waited till a key moment and then everybody switched on the dance floor. It was just sort right. of it was so their fun. Club out there on commercial way. And it, you know, it might be that there were common actions like that, but it really there was really not binding in the community until the AIDS project uh, uh, or the epidemic really made it happen. And, and I think um, there's, lots of uh, uh, different stories about when the AIDS project started and some of the things that sort of happened in those early years. Jerry, uh, uh, th there were six, you just saw some pictures and included in there out of the community meeting and process that Jerry described, there were six original directors. And it was Sean Wharton who you saw as the first picture, Jerry and I, who you're looking at right now, uh, Ray Martinez, who at least his partner, Carter Wilson, was in one of those pictures. Yes. I can't remember if we saw Ray. A and then there was Gerald Landers and Wesley who, who went by. Those were the six sort of original ones. And, and then some. we had a second wave of board members and after the first year. And I saw some of them are on the the participant call tonight. I saw Sally Blumenthal, her picture was there. Ken Koenig's picture was there. Margie Brown's picture was there. Um, George Wolf's picture was there. There are two of them now. And the, uh, Joanne Simpson was, I think, in that wave. And there was this Aaron Miller, 
uh, uh, I think there was this wave of people that after the first one started and, and just to see that discussion, Sean went to the Shanti training and Shanti was already starting to deliver services in San Francisco and they had developed a buddy system where there would be one person to support one person that was uh, ill. Sean went to that training and came back and then he was the buddy for the first few clients until after a while, it's like one person couldn't handle it. And it led to the development of a, of a system where people were trained similar to the way Shanti trained and people started doing it until we got up to having a couple of hundred clients at the height of the epidemic. Um, Jerry, you might want to talk about those early days and Joe picked up on it too when she was executive director. Well, I think what characterized the early days is that before we had the test, we didn't know who was sick. Suddenly people were getting sick. There was no therapeutics available at all. And so we had a situation where the only thing, and not to minimize it, that we could offer was emotional support and practical support for people. And I think, again, that book that we read highlights that. We saw the example of very good friends showing up and groups of people showing up in hospital rooms or in people's apartments. The big issue even in those days was toxoplasmosis and the issue of having a cat and dealing with the litter box. And so there were uh, PWAs with pets. I think we formed a separate group and they would walk the dogs for people who couldn't do that. They would clean the litter boxes for people and they would come in and out, no ego, just coming to do what they wanted to do. And our challenge at SCAP was to keep uh, an all volunteer organization going and vital. And so for us, the challenge was creating structures that allowed the volunteers to get something in return to have in uh, personal contacts. Because it was so traumatic, there were so many deaths. And often when someone was paired with a buddy within a year, they had died. So this happened very, very rapidly that we had to set up a whole system of support for the caregivers so that they could still be on staff and could be used to work with the next person that came along. And therefore the whole mental health community came forward and volunteered their time to provide free services to support the volunteers and also the people with AIDS who needed counseling. Uh, because one of our biggest challenges was actually physicians. There was only one physician in the county who was willing to treat HIV AIDS patients, I publicly state that, and that was Arnold Leff. And um, his, picture, his picture went by earlier. <laughs> And uh, my first intervention, when I went to visit one of my first people, uh, one of the clients that I was seeing who was in the hospital and dying, was to bring the food tray into them because the food staff would not go into the rooms and people were wearing moon suits around these mm. people. So uh, the whole idea of just getting health care to people and finding a sympathetic ear. In fact, it wasn't until the mid 90s that we could find a local dentist that would work with people who had HIV AIDS. We had to drive the folks up to San Francisco to get dental care, care or a cleaning in those times. So there were tremendous obstacles and yet a tremendous commitment to keep on going and not be thwarted by the impediments. And I really think our story and the story that the book is the story of resilience how people champion on and move forward even during the bleakest times and can still find things to value and to laugh about and feel human about in the face of such a terrible situation. And I think that's what we all witnessed during the AIDS epidemic, certainly in the mid eighties before therapeutics were around. I want to go to Joe, but let me just add one quick thing, which is <clears throat> under Joe as executive director and later me, uh, our dental program was transportation vouchers to San Francisco because there were no dentists here. And to put in a plug for an existing program, the AIDS project <clears throat> uh, put Ryan White money, when the first Ryan White money came, to just be one of the many people to help start the Dientes Clinic. And it's because the Dientes Clinic would see people with HIV, which we could not get seen by any other dentist in the county at the time. Joe, how about that period for you? Well, um, it was an incredible effort because people would walk in the door and we became their family. 
and they got surrounded with care. Even though they couldn't get health care, you know, we were all pulling all our personal strengths. And when I say we, I'm talking about hundreds of volunteers. You know, every person ended up with anywhere from two to five people who were part of their team helping them manage this disease. And it was an incredible effort. And I remember the earthquake. We all remember the earthquake, right? And um, I was at the office actually putting together the paperwork for our first audit. And the earthquake hit, everything went flying and a bunch of us ended up in the doorway. And afterwards I came in and people started calling. The volunteers started calling and saying, I checked in on my client and they're okay. And a couple of days later, we got a phone call from a woman who wanted to volunteer for all those poor AIDS patients. I think she was trying to figure out the, the bottom of the bottom of who she could help. And um, I said, that's great. That's really great. We have a training, it's 40 hours. And she was like, what? <laughs> And I finally said, you know what? The Red Cross is taking people off the street. They have a lot of work that needs to get done, but I don't think that, you know, it's gonna work for you because it's a big commitment. You really have to say you're gonna stay. Um, that, was, that was such a great um, example of how much people stepped up and how much time they spent caring for the people who became part of their family. We had trainings specific around working with people who had substance abuse issues, around people who weren't out. Um, and a number of our clients were presented as straight married men. And we knew that they weren't. Um, we knew they were married men and they were straight on some level, but we also knew a lot about their lives. And those were the we cared for people and never told their, they got to tell their own story and how they wanted to present it to the world. Um, it was, it, it was an amazing, amazing time. And I think it is hard to also on the flip side, <clears throat> that's an amazing time because within a community, people rose and pulled together. But at the same time, it was a struggle in the greater community. Oh, yeah. And there was a time, I was on the Santa Cruz City Council at the time, and <clears throat> I think it was in May 1983, I introduced a resolution that there should be more money for research and, and for services for people with HIV. And it passed unanimously, but I could see everybody squirming and there was uncomfortability. And once the AIDS project started, there was a woman in Santa Cruz who was told by her boss if she continued to volunteer at the AIDS project, he would fire her. And then when she continued to volunteer, she was fired. And so I had to introduce an ordinance, which was a story in itself, to protect non-discrimination on the basis of HIV status. But that would cover people that might be volunteers at SCAP that didn't have HIV because there was that level of fear and that level of response that was going on in the broader community. And it is hard to, to sort of fathom of what that was when that was happening. And so part of the struggle, what, what uh, uh, you know, Jerry and Joe were talking about was everybody being open in a way that you caused a community dialogue and you brought people along and you worked in a way that and there were some people early on, I mean, I just did a tape for the, the Planned Parenthood benefit last week because they were one of the few organizations that just stood there at that time. They were for uh, um, public sound education based on science, non-judgmental. And th th it was amazing how rare that was. It, it, and they really stood with it. It's why I stand with them because it's like in that period, it's like you can't ever forget what they were doing in that time because there just weren't many people doing it. it, yeah. it, it, it's, it, it it's tough to recall. There's also one story and, and Joe, I think knows it better than I do, but we did a lot of events out at Trinity Church and there was a guy that was a client 
he was a friend of mine, his partner, and he had grown up in Santa Cruz and he had grown up in that church. Then <clears throat> I always said, we are here for you. Uh, uh, that's what this church is for. As he was growing up, well, he gets HIV and he goes back to the church and he speaks to them. And he said, you said when I was a kid that you would be here for me. Well, I need you. It, it, and it was interesting because at his memorial, uh, there were all these parishioners that were very conventional, prob probably a lot of them were very conservative, and they stood up and told the story about how they were sitting there, and it was like, geez, but I guess we did say that and all this stuff. And so they got really involved in his care, and they got really involved in the AIDS project, and it brought them together as a religious community in support of people in a way that that just wasn't who they were when they started. It made, we even, we, one of the things Jerry talks about mental health, the Joe started this thing where she got a, out of the state grant, they funded a counselor that would meet with the staff every month because, and the staff would have to, instead of suffering all this grief and loss and taking it out on other staff members, you talk about it so that you could work through it. And mm -hmm. many times the place we would meet was at the Trinity Church because they offered it as a free room because they were working, coming out of this parishioner that sort of brought them into the fold. And so there were some very special things that happened in the community uh, uh, around this. I mean, yeah, there were weird things, but uh, uh, some people really, really came forward and they came forward in ways that I don't think they knew they could when it all started. That was the really interesting thing. And, and, and it was very powerful. One of the, um, one of the things that I remember was when we had to move the first time we were housed with the seniors council and they were expanding. So they needed the room we were in. And I started calling realtors who were advertising places for rent. And all of a sudden these places were not available. And it went on and on and on. And finally I got so pissed that I went to the Sentinel and I said, what's up? You know, this is how many times we've got turned down. And they published the story. And I got a call the next day from somebody who said, I have a place for you to rent, come and see it. And from that, other people who were in the business community finally were able to invite someone from SCAP to come talk to their chamber of commerce which was an amazing um, thing to do. And uh, it was actually an outgoing person who was the president or chair of the, the chamber that year who invited me before he stepped down. But others stepped forward after that and they had a lot of questions and most of them were pretty educated. But I do remember someone saying, well, you pointing at me, you have to get people to stop lying when they sign up for health insurance. And I said, think about what you would do if you were in this situation, you know, and you thought maybe you were sick and you did not have health insurance. Would you fudge it just so you could? And then I started talking about the, the costs of what it was like to have pneumocystis and go in the hospital, $40,000. You know, all the different things that were so incredibly expensive. In the end, that person who asked that question about health insurance in a fairly antagonistic way came up to me afterwards and he eventually became a volunteer. It was so great. And, uh, and you see, there's that, and then there were these things. I mean, I was not executive director till the early 1990s for, for three years. And you forget also about the absence of civil rights. And mm -hmm. so there were situations where couples had bought a house together and had lived their life together 
and were estranged from their family, but it was the family that had been the ones doing the estrangement. And then as somebody was really sick, they would bomb into town. They would prohibit the partner from visiting in the hospital because there weren't rights. <clears throat> and when the death happened, they would try to take half the house and do other stuff from sort of the person that they didn't recognize that had been there as the spouse and the person that was support as this person went through this horrible situation. And so, you know, it's why one of the first issues with domestic partners in those first fights for benefits was visitation rights in hospitals mm -hmm. because of situations that had come right out of this. And it's, it's easy to forget that, that that stuff would just happen right in the middle of this when you think, how could anybody be so cruel and yet it would happen? You mm -hmm. know? And Jerry, you probably had to talk to a lot of, um, of people professionally and you didn't, you didn't say clearly at first that for a period of time, you were the only therapist that was seeing anybody that was like in this well, category. Three or four years, I was the only person in the Tri-County area that was either receiving phone calls about HIV AIDS or seeing people with HIV AIDS, which is why I really wanted to form the Santa Cruz AIDS Project because it, it was untenable. I was getting at the end, 20 to 30 phone calls a day from the worried well. You know, can I use a toilet seat? Can I use a hot tub? All of that anxiety was really up in the general population. And I had been identified as someone who had gotten educated about the disease. And so most of the calls were coming in my direction, which was almost impossible. But I, I wanted to say one other thing. On top of everything we're talking about, uh, the Great Believers highlights an element there that I wanna talk about, which is shame. So lesbians and gays were coming out from being shamed from the Christian community, okay? And while we, we just in the 70s, we were at gay pride, there was that sense of self, a sense of defining oneself by oneself rather than having someone else define you. This was part of the identity movement that came out of the women's movement, natural growth from that. And in the midst of gays and lesbians struggling with their own shame, we have this amplification of the shame that occurs during the AIDS project, where religious figures become dominant, say terrible things in public. It's in the media everywhere. Uh, local community churches feel permission to uh, reiterate these statements. And in the midst of this, men are becoming disformed. They can't step out in the streets without being seen. They start hiding themselves and cloaking, and they're redoubled in their feeling of shame at the same time. The antidote to that, back to resilience, was suddenly allies appeared who were not gay or lesbian, who said, we don't buy that narrative either. And that for me was the first time I had seen so many allies show up and say, we know who you are. You are a friend, our coworker, our former husband or wife. We know who you are. We know you're worthy and we're going to, we're going to help you. And I think that was profound and in the general sense for those who had HIV AIDS, but also for all of us who were involved, the humanity cut across these uh, narratives that had created obstacles and blocks for so long. All of a sudden we know there, when someone is dying, when someone is uh, in extreme need, it really pulls for humanity. And our community showed up really, really well in a very broad, humane way. Now, there were terrible exceptions, terrible exceptions. And if I were a little more mean, I would name names, but I'm not gonna do that. Uh, but I will say that was not the majority of, of Santa Cruz. And I think people really tried to show up well. And I think that really changed the tone for our community thereafter. And I didn't experience, uh, I experienced in my practice, a much lower incidence of people feeling that profound shame that so many people came in to see me as they were trying to merge in their identity. Because it was so clear that we could create community and we could take care of ourselves. And the fear before that, because of the shame, was that you come out, you're going to be isolated, alone, and you're never going to find love in your life. And the AIDS project showed the exact opposite of that. And I think that was really profound and still reverberates today. And Joe, uh, one of the prime examples of what Jerry's saying 
it is the whole thing around the last laugh. Mm -hmm. Why don't you explain what the last laugh was? Because I think it's a great story. So um, I think it was 1989, um, Karen Babbitt, who is a wonderful, wonderful comedian, came into the office and said, I want to organize bringing a bunch of comedians to town to train people with AIDS to do stand-up comedy. And I was like, what? <laughs> and um, it just was so different. It sounded like it would just be a gas, right? And I started thinking of who would step forward for this. And Karen had actually pitched the idea to the San Francisco AIDS Project and they didn't want anything to do with it. So we started recruiting and we ended up with nine people. They were all men, they were all gay, and they were from Santa Cruz and Santa Clara and a, a person or two from San Francisco. And Karen brought in some really well-known and um, famous actors, I mean, comedians, and they spent the weekend. There's actually a, a video that is a documentary of this and you can find it online on YouTube. And they spent the weekend learning how to do stand-up comedy with their own story. And it was, in the end, these are the pictures. And um, it was a total blast. There were hundreds of people in the audience. People told great stories. And um, the thing that really impressed me was some of the people like the gentleman in the middle was a really quiet guy. And um, he would not, I, I was just shocked <laughs> that he volunteered to do this because he couldn't get him to talk in a meeting, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and it was just so profound that people, it's, it's that thing of resilience and pride and people did a great job and it and it stayed in the community for a really really long time i mean people were just like oh my god we got to keep doing this we got to keep doing it but it was um it was an incredible effort it took many dozens of people to provide all the meals for people to put people up it was a big organizing campaign and um and karen who still lives in town she actually lives in ben loman near me uh, is uh, still does comedy, stand-up comedy. So you should you should look it up. It's really really a beautiful. And it, it, you, you'll have to help me, but I remember Will Durst, who's well known, was one of the comedians. It, it was people like that that came down and and did a routine, and they did a routine, and they trained them. It was a really uh, powerful thing. Well, you know, we're reaching that time where uh, the audience can submit questions. And I think at eight o'clock, we'll, we'll start taking the questions. And I think that um, you can put them in the, the Q&A feature that is uh, there. And I think Sarah's going to, um, to give us questions when we get to that. But maybe in the few minutes up to us taking questions, it's like, and, you know, it's our last chance before we just go wherever the, the crowd wants to go. What do you think the legacy is from this? What do you look back and think has has come out of this? And uh, Jerry, you want to take the first crack at that? Okay. Uh, well, I first thing I want to reiterate is I really thought that that event forged a bond between the men and women in the community uh, that really is still vibrant and alive today. And that was, that was a very, very dramatic shift. The other thing that was a change, of course, and it was a change for the nation, was that doctors started to listen to patients rather than patients having to be passive and quiet and follow mm -hmm. the doctor. The doctors were really stuck. They had nothing to offer other than tests, which were uncomfortable and painful frequently. So uh, they, they had to change their stance and listen to the clients more carefully and figure out what was palliative for them rather than trying to fix something which they didn't understand just yet. So I think the patient-doctor relationship changed dramatically as a result of the AIDS uh, epidemic. 
and certainly the medical establishment did with the onset, of course, Fauci stepping in and Kessler stepping in way back then in the mid eighties and now reappearing again in this epidemic. There's a, a deja vu feeling happening here, but I remember uh, meeting Fauci and, and Kessler at conferences and feeling very reassured. Number one, they did not identify as gay and lesbian and they were committed and they were gonna do the right thing. So I think that was a profound uh, situation. And then lastly, and then I'll stop, the relationship that developed between the gay and lesbian community and the governmental structures in Santa Cruz County was strengthened as a result of the AIDS epidemic. And as such, uh, later on our involvement and this, the sophistication that we had gained while dealing with these issues, the rest of the community uh, exploited and used to our delight as we use these skills to deal with other populations who had need. So those are three legacy things that stand right out from the top for me. Joe? Um, from, in my view, the merging of having, having people who were thick become the speakers in the community about the AIDS epidemic, about the healthcare system, about disabilities um, was a model that actually a number of other AIDS programs across the country adopted. It changed communities because the person standing in front of you is the, is the person that all this stuff is about. And people were honest and told their stories. That model is used now um, in the gay and lesbian LGBT community. It's used in the disability community. At one time, um, the director of the mental health program at Encompass approached me to train their clients, most of whom were had mental illness and were homeless to do the same thing because it was like, oh my God, this person has AIDS and they, they're gonna publicly come here. You know, it, it took away the shame and it empowered people. And the, the system we set up was symbiotic because the people who were learning to be educators and becoming educators found purpose in their illness. And it also strengthened them so that the part of them that was receiving medical care, it, they, they played off on one another. And it really helped people live longer, I think. Um, the other thing that's a legacy is on a national level, the LGBT and AIDS movement working with the disability movement past the ADA, the Americans with Disability Act. Neither community could do it on their own. And those two communities coming together were so powerful that um, the legislators couldn't over, I mean, they just couldn't bear it because we all had communities that we were strong in. And, um, and that's really the reason why the ADA passed. The other thing that I think is a legacy is really communities coming together, lots of different kinds of communities working together. It still happens in Santa Cruz. It happens in other communities where Santa Cruz people migrated to and use that model. Why don't we talk to so-and-so? Why aren't they here? That really made a big difference. And then the last piece um, both of you spoke of is changing the way elected officials dealt with community needs. And I remember I, every year we had to go to all the cities and the county and basically ask for money, right? And um, we as a community had come together with all the other nonprofits and we did it as a group. But I remember when a very well-known um, and beloved person in Capitola died of AIDS. And going before the, the Capitola City Council, which was fairly conservative at the time, and I just stood there at the podium and said, you know what I'm talking about. And you know what the reality is in Capitola. And it's time for you to step up and put up the money that your constituents need. And that statement of not going with my hand out and not saying, oh, please, oh, please, will you fund us? And saying, no, it's time. It's time for you to step up and be responsible. It, it spread 
And everybody started doing that and not, not continuing to act like we weren't providing essential services to their constituents. And I think there was a shift on all the different public levels, um, particularly the Board of Supervisors, for them to start looking at this as a community, um, as community care that their public health commission couldn't do and their mental health commission couldn't do, but all of these nonprofits could do. And, I, and it empowered nonprofits to really start acting like we were doing what we were doing. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. And I think that, that uh, everything that Jerry and Joe said is so true. They are practical, tangible legacies that came from, from what was going on in that time. But I think the other thing I just want to acknowledge is, is there was tremendous loss. And it's interesting because the picture of Michael Perlman was just there. And by the way, Marty Wormhout, when she and I were on the city councils when he was sick and she was doing practical support for Michael Perlman and she was yeah. the mayor. She was the mayor and, and there'd be a time, oh, no, I'm gonna be late to the meeting. I have to get pajamas for Michael at whatever it is. She was buying it or she she would do stuff and, and she mm -hmm. would never let anybody else step in and do it. She just stepped up for him. And I think one of the issues that was a little sort of known is that she had a son that knew Michael same age when they were in Los Angeles before they were both up here. And she just really saw her son in him in ways that I think it was very personal for her. And, uh, you know, I think Michael, God, he would love what was going on right now. Mm -hmm. He would love the marriage and all the things that have happened. He would have really, uh, uh, and I can't believe I wore a shirt with Queen Elizabeth that said, what a queen. I forgot all about that till this keeps flashing up. It's like, uh, uh, somehow I got elected <laughs> after that. Uh, uh, um, but the, the, the other thing, I was just going to tell one story that's really tough, and that's it. Um, <clears throat> I was in the legislature the first time around, and there's this young gay guy that I knew here in Sacramento who said, um, I'm going to Sac City College and we have a debate club and we're having a fundraiser and it's gonna be the readings of Howard Zinn. And I would like you to come and be one of the 10 people that does the reading and said, okay, what, what do you want me to read? And he sends me these two things and one of them is Vito Rousseau and Vito, he, he did some time in Santa Cruz. He wrote the celluloid closet about the way that gays and lesbians were treated in the cinema up until modern times. It was like the definitive work on the subject for many years. And he wrote this uh, essay in the middle when he was with the AIDS men's health crisis and act up in New York uh, on why we fight. And it was about the fact that the New York Times had done an editorial and they said, don't worry about HRV. It hasn't gotten to the mainstream population. And he writes this just fiery essay uh, on what you said, who are we, chop liver? And I mean, just really strong. I think, oh, great, I'll read this. And I get about halfway through and I just crack at every word. I cannot, I don't know, it just reached me back in the times. And I mean, I didn't, I didn't even crack that way when speaking at my father's funeral. It, it was just uh, uh, emotional. And I think it just put it back in a way that you couldn't describe any other way to what the time and the place was, that mix of community, of loss, of in some way powerlessness in the greater thing, even if we felt powerful in our own. And it, it, it's one thing that you just can't quite forget. For, when I was done, I sat down and they clapped for about two minutes and it was just like, leave me alone. I just bled all over you, just leave me alone. You, you, you know, and because um, I think I was shocked. I don't think I knew. It, it's kind of like my father who, uh, fought in World War II and wouldn't talk about it for 30 or 40 years, not until the end of his life. And I thought, oh my God, has that become me that somehow there's in, and I'm in a, a trivia group up here when you can be in person in one of the local bars. And they said a few years ago, there's this great 
um, documentary out on something called the gay men's health crisis in New York. Would you go with us to see it? And they're all a generation younger. And I felt like I was telling them what had happened in the Civil War when, the, when they asked about it, because it was a different time and a different place. And yet it was part of their legacy. And they realized that a lot of things that they had going for them when they were younger came out of this period in the things that people did in response. And so I think the legacy goes always in this. Well, Sarah, uh, do you want to shoot us a question that has come from the, uh, uh, the, the question section there? Absolutely. Your first question, this is from the book. And it's a quote. It says he, Yale, had been cultivating numbness all day, hanging on to it like a rope. But everything had scabbed over. And now there was an idea, this imperative to somehow be happy. Then uh, the question, I think, is do you think there's any PTSD or grief around COVID for those who were in or are now in the LGBTQ plus community both then and now? Uh, I can't imagine that it, this isn't stimulating uh, memories and feelings and thoughts uh, of the time gone by. However, for those of us who were there and are still here now, it's age appropriate for us now. I, I, I don't think people can understand what it's like to watch 20 year olds and 30 year olds die or 16 year olds die way before their time. So that, um, I think, again, what I'm thinking is that for those who've gone through everything, we have resilience. And I find myself saying to people, we have a vaccine. We still don't have a vaccine for AIDS, HIV at all. We already have a, a, a vaccine. We just need to be patient, do the behaviorally correct things, and we'll get through this together. And I think that is a great salve for PTSD for people, but I can't imagine that this isn't evocative of loss. In my practice itself, I lost over a hundred patients in, in six years. And so for many of us who dealt intimately with the epidemic, for some of us, we've had to wall it off in order to go forward because we just couldn't be with all the ghosts. I find there's just not enough room in a room to accommodate all the people who are gone to sit on my shoulder. So I pick one or two each day and they sort of are my, um, my fine angels who sit on my shoulder. And I think that is one of the legacies we have. And I'm hoping the people who are struggling now who survived the AIDS epidemic can remember that they have the legacy of being survivors, of being wise, and can perhaps share that knowledge with the younger communities, the whole community, because I, uh, I don't know how you can compare epidemics, but HIV AIDS was really a horse of a different color than this. And, and it, yet, it was very dramatic. And yet two things, at the beginning of the COVID a pandemic, there were a few times that I saw references in things that said, we've never experienced a viral attack like this. And it was sort of like, what are you talking about? <laughs> what can you possibly be saying uh, uh, about that? Because it, it's, of course we have, and, and I need to give Jerry uh, one kudo here because somewhere around a, a year, year and a half ago, the health department had the first community meeting uh, on HIV in maybe 10 years. And Jerry, in this moment uh, um, where it was highlighted that the, the populations most at risk were Latino and gay men to this day, and Jerry just can't stand it. And so he stands up and says, and how many are in the room? You're you, you know, and he, and he does his thing, which was a wonderful moment. And he and I talked about it afterwards. And he said, actually, the real thing is, is some virus is going to hit them and they just have to be ready. And so at the beginning of COVID, I sort of called Jerry and he says, well, it wasn't rocket science. It, it's like, you can see this coming. Mm -hmm. it, it, and so, you know, Joe, anything you want to say in response to that question? No, Joe, you're muted. There you Sorry. Go. I had the Anyway, um, I think you guys covered it. 
Okay. okay. Sarah, you got another question for us? I certainly do. It says, are any of you involved in the Santa Cruz Diversity Center and are they carrying on or building up the Santa Cruz AIDS project? Well, I'm involved with the Diversity Center. I was just co-chair of their capital campaign, which they have just reached. And it's a great thing for stabilizing it. But the AIDS project is really in with Encompass that uh, Jerry just mentioned is the successor agency of the Community Counseling Center where Jerry was doing his counseling when he first came to town. And I think it's just a different thing. And my my personal anecdote is, is they do booths at like Gay Pride and other things. And I walk up and say, I was once the director of the Santa Cruz AIDS Project. And they look at me like I'm from Mars. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, Who's it's, that old it's, man, it's, they say. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just a different generation. And it, 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 it's, it's what it is. I don't know if Jerry and Joe want to add to that. I had the same experience with them. <laughs> <laughs> they're young, they're excited, they knew what they're they know what they're doing and they're talking to the right demographic, the right age group. Um, I think that they're they're focused more on prevention of STDs um, as well as as AIDS. But it's it's metamorphosized, I think yeah. it needed well, to. Uh, Sarah, you got another question? No, but I, ha I do have another uh, question, but I have some lovely comments too I wanted to convey. It says, Joe, John, and Jerry, thank you for the wonderful, thoughtful, and tender presentation of a sad and sacred time in our community. You three were and are beacons of light for us all. Thank you. And it says, there's a bond among the AIDS warriors, people who committed their time and effort to make a difference and show up we were gay, straight, whatever. Most of us all, we were human together. This bond continues to this day and keeps us all connected and proud. It wasn't a decision, just what was had to happen uh, with gratitude. My life is richer for this experience. Mm, thank you. It was, um, it was really the most powerful work I've ever done. And there wasn't a decision. For me, it wasn't a decision to make. Mm -hmm. it, it was in front of us. We had to go forward. Uh, and it, we just took one step at a time. We had no idea what we were doing. Uh, we made it up as we went along. Uh, we made many, many mistakes. And uh, we laughed a lot together. And that kept us going, I think. And I think now, also we all did what we were good at or we thought we were good at, yeah. you, you know, whether Jerry was counseling or Joe was organizing and administering in a really good way or doing grant writing. And, and when we got all the way up to 15 uh, LGBT out elected officials in the country in 1985, we formed an elected officials association with the 15 of us. And we would have a conference in the winter, that was our traditional conference. And in the spring, we would go lobby for HIV in Washington. And, you know, we would do what some of us did the best. I remember the, the guy, one of the other very first out mayors was of Laguna Beach. The first three were, were beach towns. I don't know what it is. It was Santa Cruz, Laguna Beach, and Key West. And so the guy from Laguna Beach, Bob Gentry, a very good friend of mine, he would be in this lobbying thing and he was represented by William Dannemeyer, the guy that was doing the anti-HIV homophobic statewide ballot measures. And so he said, okay, this is what we're gonna do. Uh, um, the Orange County newspaper has a reporter back here and I'm gonna call him and you and I are gonna walk with the reporter into Dannemeyer's office. And so we just went in and, and when they saw the reporter and we said we were elected officials, they had to start behaving and they were really nervous. And it was, and it became a story that we were like pursuing that. There were people out there that were saying that there should not be a stigma here and their discrimination was off base. And it, it, and it was a way that sort of on the political side, I could, and then what I would do too, because Joe and Michael were doing the Lavender Reader, I had a column in every issue that ever 
uh, ran on politics. And so I would report back, okay, we went and lobbied in Washington and we did this, you know, or, or whatever. It was a way that you could sort of bring the community along on that part of it while people were doing either therapy or there were incredible massage people that donated. There were people that did a food pantry. There was a guy that, that was a senior placement that would do nothing but birthday cards to all the volunteers. Uh, uh, you know, there was just, there was uh, um, Project First Hand where people were trained as speakers and they would go into unusual places and uh, uh, just tell their story uh, uh, in a way that moved people every time. Everybody did what they were good at in, in a way being driven by exactly what, what Jerry and Joe uh, were saying. And there were even, when you talk about laughing a lot, it, it's like Ruth Moda, who was head of education when I was director and when Joe was, we had these charts that were our presentation charts. And she had a volunteer that was dating a guy that was into lamination. And so he laminated all these charts. And then she comes in one day and says, oh, really bad news. It, it's like they've broken up. <laughs> and then she comes back a week or two later and says, I didn't think this was the thing, but he's with somebody new and that person is a laminator. <laughs> and so the next thing we know, we're, we're getting our charts laminated again, you know, and, and you do just what, Jerry and Joe are doing now, all you could do is laugh. You think, really, lamination is a thing? <laughs> you, 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 you know, and yet it, even the laminators were stepping up and doing what it took to make sure that we were just moving ahead. And, and so that response was just incredible across the community. You know, one time uh, we got a call from someone in Australia because they had read we put out a manual on how to do um, public sex environment outreach. We knew every single public sex environment place in Santa Cruz County. And um, we trained people on how to go and talk to people and give them condoms and educate. So this guy in Australia had started like a education program and he wanted to know if we could send him a bunch of copies of the book. So we went to community printers <laughs> and got a bunch of copies and send them off to Australia because they were going to spread the word. It was so great and it's, how the influence that just kept going from our little, little area, what we were able to do very quickly, we could change. We were, but the word of the year this year is pivot. We could pivot. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, um, let me also say one of the challenges we had, and one of the things I always liked from the education people, is the, like one time I was going to speak to the Watsonville Rotary Club. I was going to speak to the Watsonville Rotary Club about HIV, and they said, remember, at every speech, you have to educate people on the transmission. And I said, well, I'm going to the Watsonville Rotary. You have to do it. You have to do it. You know, and so I am trying to explain very simply and key to the Watsonville Rotary in the middle of a over thing, how you do that. And, and you see, and one of the things Joe just did that made me smile is she said public sex environment, like you all know what that means. It, 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 and so, you know, it's beaches on the North Coast where people pick each other up in anonymous sex and you go to those places and you intervene and, and SCAP did a manual that was adopted across the country on how to intervene in those situations. And it was as what Jerry said, it was inventing it as you went along. That was a problem. And whenever there was a problem, I mean, when I was executive director, you had this budget, you were never sure you're gonna meet it. And you knew that certain things. And then there was a time when a kid with HIV was you know, identified in a childcare center and it caused a big thing. So the next thing I know, I went to the county and they gave us a grant to educate childcare centers. And we put our education team and in going in childcare centers and explaining what really was risk, what transmission really was, what safe practices were. And we were just ready to move into whatever situation was going on when that, mm -hmm. when that happened. Yeah, great preparation for being in the state senate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're getting ready to deal with just any brick that flies through the air at you, and that that was a, a perfect train. Well, Sarah, I know we have about 
10 or 15 minutes left. Do you have more questions? I do. So what I'll do is I'll give you some more um, gratitude and accolades, and then I'll oh. read off another question for you. How about that? It says, thank you for sharing your experiences. Thank you for all that you did for Santa Cruz County, California, and all over the world. I'm so impressed and proud of all of you. Um, Santa Cruz AIDS Project was one of the first of its kind in the nation. Always appreciate hearing your memories of that time, an important history of Santa Cruz and for the nation. Thank you. Thank you. And it says, it's so beautiful seeing you and hearing these stories. You did so much research, not just academic, but into your memories, which at our age can be very difficult. <laughs> this has been so powerful and evocative memories of so much grief, so much difficulty remembering the struggle over the Cabrillo Children's Center coming up with an AIDS policy regarding children who had AIDS family members. Remember all those beautiful young men. And so how about we uh, take this last question and it says, do you think that one of the legacies of the AIDS epidemic era has been that our contemporary LGBT community is now more inclined to pursue careers, volunteer work in public health? Mm -hmm. And do you have any advice for those of us who work in organizations that stir serve stigmatized populations and as such receive vitriolic, vitriolic pushback from some of the locals? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, let's take the easy part first. Let's take the first question. Of course, people went into public health and of course they were motivated in it. I know so many people that went to get their masters of public health at, at different schools and people that became phlebotomists. I mean, they're just whatever it was, there was a lot of, of things that came out of that because I think it's Frankly, it's, it, it's not unlike me running for office the first time. There's certain times you think, well, I can do better than them uh, 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 when they're being really exclusionary or whatever. And I think when, when people saw a people that didn't respond in the medical community or be people that did respond in the medical community, either one was a motivation for going in and seeing this is what you could do or this is what needs to be done. And I would add that uh, in keeping with uh, what I'd said before, I think it's very hard to move into professions where you're highly visible and take responsible positions if you're overwhelmed with shame. Mm -hmm. And so part of what happened here was a detoxification of historical and systemic shame over time that only became more and more healing with time as we became uh, louder in our voices and felt more community support around us. So uh, I noticed the dramatic shift, and I'm sure uh, the other folks did, in watching gays and lesbians actually step into whatever their passion was and pursue it and not feel like that was, there was the obstacle because of identity. But that was also true, not only in profession, but in everything, how they walked, how they dressed, how we expressed ourselves how we were more visible in the media. We weren't going to be, there's a gay comedian somewhere. We might be the, lay, the lead comedian or the lead writer in a series. And we were claiming that and owning that more and the community was willing to see us and uh, honor us also. And I think that's why we were able to move into so many professions is because the narrative of shame is less and less acceptable acceptable to both gays and lesbians and also our ally community. They don't reverberate or engage in that as frequently. And that made a huge shift once those obstacles were taken down and we could see ourselves for who we were rather than the distortions that people had about us and wanted us to claim for our own. And at that time, um, many of us had to do that on our own by our own, uh, I mean, one of my favorite stories is, is the day after I was elected mayor in 1983, the next day, the Santa Cruz Sentinel referred to me as the gay mayor. And so I called up the editor and I said, geez, you went 110 years without ever calling anybody the straight mayor. It's like, I'm the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> and they dropped it immediately. And it was like, and later I thought, wow, I did that. <laughs> I can't believe I called them and said that, you, yeah. you, you, you know, but it was the exact right thing for, for what was going on. And I think it was always important to send a signal that 
I'm sorry, there's self-respect here mm -hmm. and, and, and you need to appreciate it. Uh, Joe, uh, that was the last question. Do you have a closing word? Yeah, um, I, I, Jerry and John, you both articulated this thing of how we come into our own power and the advice for the person who asked the question about working with communities is set it up so that people can come into their own power and can tell their own story. Because having you as an advocate go to an elected or a public place or whatever doesn't have the same impact as having the person themselves. You know, and I look at the controversy around people who are homeless. And, you know, it's much broader than one group who are camping somewhere, but those, all the stories aren't getting out from the people who are living it. And that's what needs to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, it's been a great night. Thank you. I think we've all uh, enjoyed doing this. Well, thank you to the three of you. It's been, it's been very lovely. And Denise is going to close us out here. Thanks, Denise. This has been so enlightening. Thank you so very much for sharing your stories and your insights with us. Uh, what a way to kick off our 2021 season. I think everybody's kind of speechless right now. Um, thank you to the friends of the Capitola Library for organizing the event tonight. And thank you very much to the audience for joining us. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring your attention to is um, if you haven't already, uh, please visit the Queer Santa Cruz virtual exhibit at the MA. Uh, there's a link, I believe, that's visible on your screen. And we look forward to seeing you at our next event, February 7th. So until then, take care, stay safe. We'll see you then. Good night. <laughs>